Hello Internet and welcome to this long overdue video where I do a top 7 of American Civil War Generals. Now, I already did one of these almost a year and a half ago, if not more as a matter of fact, and it became really popular by the standards of my tiny, tiny, teeny little channel. In fact, it's by far the most popular video I have done so far with 12,000 views. Now, I realize that for a lot of channels, 12,000 views is something you get before breakfast if you actually upload at dawn, but for a channel that talks about history and who can basically be said to be amateur historics by an amateur for amateurs, this is actually a rather successful video, considering the fact that I did absolutely no kind of editing, my sound equipment was completely terrifying, and, well, everything I do is original content, so yay, go me. Anyway, there has been many comments about that video saying you should also have mentioned this guy and this guy and this guy, and I have constantly promised I would get around to making a follow-up, because the first video I did only people who had been in command of their own armies. I cheated a little bit to get someone like Stonewall Jack in, but as a general rule you had to be in command of your own forces, not as a corps commander or division commander under someone else. For that reason several very worthy generals were left out and I have been pilloried for that repeatedly. So finally after much procrastination I have gotten around to do the follow-up that I promised so long ago, this of course being that follow-up in which I will be looking at civil war generals who were in corps or division command rather than army command. This will perhaps be even more controversial than some of the stuff I said in the first one, as there are of course far many more worthies during such a video listing than there was just of those who had actual army command. But, well, let's hop to it. First of all, I want to mention some of the also rants. Division or core commanders that absolutely could have been on my list, but for one reason or another just didn't find themselves within my top seven. There could be the Confederate Hill generals, Ambrose Powell and Daniel Hill, both of them doing rather spectacular work, but just not enough to get onto my top seven list such as it is. We can stay in the Confederacy and pick R.D., the man who quite literally wrote the book on infantry maneuver and actually lived it. Did great jobs as well, but was perhaps a little bit hampered by being mostly out west and often serving under not entirely brilliant army commanders, so he does doesn't quite get in. From the north you could mention people like Edward Ord, who was a brilliant division and corps commander, but who perhaps rose to prominence a little bit too late in the war to really make his mark to the degree that so many of the others did. Or of course northern cavalry commanders such as Thomas Devon or John Buford, who all did sterling work during the difficult years when the northern cavalry could not in any way be said to be equal or superior to that of the South. But, again, there are plenty of people who could have been mentioned, but let's get on to the thing we are here for. My top seven list of American Civil War generals in Corps or Division Command. Enjoy! <laughs> Number seven, John Bell Hood. Now, I had some very big doubts in my mind whether this should be John Bell Hood or if it should be John Reynolds from the Federals or, for that matter, John Schofield, who also fought for the North. And, in my opinion, every one of those could have taken this particular position. But, in the end, I went with John Bell Hood because I felt like I was perhaps doing him a little bit of a disservice during my last video where I mentioned him as one of those Confederate commanders of armies who were significantly incompetent. And this is true, he was actually significantly incompetent as commander of his own army. As Lee pointed out, he was all lion and no fox, and he managed to destroy the last main confederate battle army in the west with his futile attacks upon Franklin and Nashville. But there was a reason why John Bell Hood was in the position to be named army commander in the first place, and that was his sterling and in fact super 
superbly brilliant work as a divisional commander in the first corps of the army of northern virginia under james longstreet in the earlier years of the war and that is why he is number seven on my list now hood was a very young man when he got division command he was born in fact only in 1831 meaning that he was only in his early 30s for most of the war and that of course meant that unlike older and wiser heads which would came back to bite him when he became a army commander he had a lot of energy and aggression as a division commander which stood him in phenomenally good stead during the seven days battle when a lot of other later brilliant southern commanders did not exactly cover themselves in any kind of glory it was hood more than anyone whose troops and whose gallantry allowed him to play a very prominent in fact perhaps the most prominent part in keeping mcclellan bottled up in the peninsula until such a time as the threat toward richmond had dissipated and lee had won his first great battle particularly the battle of gaines mill hood and his texans were preeminent on the battlefield in that particular campaign later at second manassas or second bull run it was hood's troops who led the successful attack that forced the union into precipitous retreat and at antietam he actually managed to basically save a lot of Stonewall's corps who had otherwise perhaps been surrounded and annihilated by holding off repeated attacks with his single division from the entire Union 1st and 2nd Corps. He then sat out much of the next couple of great battles in the East Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville but at Gettysburg while he actually had a fairly bad time there it was hardly his fault. Arriving late on the first day with the rest of Longstreet's corps on the second day he was ordered to do a weird sort of march into the Union forces around Little Round Top while he himself instead pleaded desperately to be allowed to take his men on a flanking maneuver that would have hit the Federals straight up the rear and in the flanks and possibly rolled up their entire position. But Longstreet, who had suggested the same maneuver to Lee but been shot down, refused to give him permission and instead Hood attacked directly into some of the strongest held Union positions and had in fact his division almost completely destroyed at the time himself being very heavily wounded and losing the use of his arm for the rest of his life but there is little doubt that if Hood had been allowed to do what he wanted to do the Battle of Gettysburg would probably have had a completely different result one of a spectacular amount of miscues and weird uncharacteristic miscues during the Battle of Gettysburg that turned it into the southern debacle that it ended up being. After that, of course, Hood then recuperated and was put in charge of Joseph Johnston's Army of Georgia when Johnston was removed from command, then facing General Sherman, General Thomas, and others out west and, well, failing miserably. But there is very little doubt that as a division commander in the early years of the war, Hood was almost without peer of anyone in the war and certainly very possibly the single best confederate division commander in the eastern theater of war during 1862 and 1863. Number six, Jeb Stewart. The man who could have become the preeminent cavalry commander of the 19th century and probably much much higher on my list if this had not been because he suffered from one major defect namely the shall we call it napoleonic complex which shows up when a successful general gets to the point of his career where glory becomes more important than success one of napoleon's great problems in the latter part of his career was that he considered his glory to be so important that he started buying into his own legend and while for Jeb Stewart it manifested in other ways than to try to cause war to spring up all over the world when you really probably should be trying for peace it 
it instead manifested in his eternal drive for admiration and positive press, which of course at the end of his career lowered him from the highest echelons down to just the very good ones. Because at the beginning of the war there is no doubt that Jeb Stuart was by far the finest cavalry commander available. He shielded his army, acted as his scouts, did sterling work when cavalry was actually called for in actual battle, which had of course already at that time started going strongly downwards, and was called the ears and eyes of the army by Robert E. Lee who considered him irreplaceable. Last time in my previous video I took Nathan Bedford Forrest as the southern cavalry commander that I actually featured because he held independent command unlike Stuart, but had Stuart done it it would have been almost impossible in the end to decide between them had it come down to sheer skill level. The reason then that Jeb Stuart is not higher than this is of course that in the end his personal foibles overcame his otherwise almost peerless military skills. Now, at the beginning of the war, in the Maryland campaign, in the original Northern Virginia campaign, at Chancellorsville, at Fredericksburg, Jeb Stuart was completely unbeatable. He did everything he was supposed to do and he did it better than anyone had a right to expect. Every time he clashed with the Northern or Federal cavalry, they were whipped back with their tails between their legs and he gave Robert E. Lee or other commanders all of the information they could ever need. In fact, he was one of the few men who was on so friendly footing with Stonewall Jackson that Jackson trusted him more than anyone else to get him news and a lot of Jackson's most sterling work came about as per shielding or information gathering from Jeb Stewart's cavalry corps. Then came Brandy Station and its, well, drawn fight with the Northern Cavalry. Then came the useless ride around the Union armies before Gettysburg that, while very glorious I'm sure in and of itself, deprived Lee of any kind of reconnaissance in the days leading up to that battle and might in fact have caused the Confederate defeat or at least caused the battle to be fought in the first place. And at this point, it had become obvious that Jeb Stuart had some flaws that were fairly easy to exploit, especially if you can press his berserk buttons at the same time, which primarily included being criticized by the Confederate press. And of course, just as he had regained his previous style and elan during the early days of the Overland campaign, Jeb Stuart was killed in a fairly minor scuffle actually at Yellow Tavern. So who was Jeb Stewart in the end? The shining and brightly successful example of cavalier confederate knighthood or the equally brilliantly shining cavalier of confederate knighthood who got so entrenched within his own legend that he actually managed to let it get in the way of his military duties. It's a hard decision to make which is why I left him out of my first video about army command and why I have him down to number six here, but there is very little doubt that the Jeb Stewart of 1861 to early 1863 definitely deserves a place high in the ranking of generals of the American Civil War and certainly cavalry generals of all time. So this is why I keep him at number six on my list of the best American Civil War generals division or corps level. Joseph Fighting Joe Hooker, even though he hated the Fighting Joe nickname, which was a result of a typographical error in a northern newspaper in the early days of the war. And yes, I know this is the first time in this video I get really controversial. Some people are probably going to be stopping and asking, why do I even have Hooker on this list and what in the name of everything that is holy am I having him above people like Jeb Stewart and many other women? these for. And it's true, again, like Hood, as a army commander, the man was certainly a failure. While he was definitely a step up morale-wise, at least from Ambrose Burnside, Burnside admittedly never wanting army command in the first place, as I mentioned in my previous video, he also led the Union armies into the worst defeat of the entire war at Chancellorsville and gave Lee his greatest victory, as well as a chance to invest the North and try to put the war 
to an end, which of course came to naught at Gettysburg. In fact, the only positive thing that can be said about Chancellorsville from Hooker's perspective was that it took the life of Stonewall Jackson, but since Stonewall was in fact shot accidentally by a Confederate picket line rather than killed in battle, I will not even give Hooker that glory from that particular catastrophe of a battle. However, despite his staggering lack of success as an army commander, and despite his multitudes of personal failings, the man was vain, touchy, spoiled, he traveled with prostitutes, he conspired against superior officers, and was horrible to those below him in command unless they happened to be his personal politically connected cronies, there is very little doubt that Hooker did some very sterling work as a corps commander. In the early years of the war, he was several times one of the few lights in the darkness of the Union armies in the east. At battles such as Second Manassas and Stone Mountain and Antietam, he was one of the few Union commanders who could actually have said to come out of it with some degree of glory, some degree of credit, following what was otherwise either defeats or battles that definitely should have been victories had it not been for other Union commanders. Of course, at Antietam, a pretty certain victory was thrown away by General McClellan's timidity while Hooker actually wanted to fight hard. And then once his debacle as chief in command of the Army of the Potomac was over, Hooker transferred back to Corps Command out in Ulysses Grant's Western armies and served with great skill and ability in the battles of Chattanooga and the earlier parts of the Atlanta campaign before once again his personal foibles got the best of him and he handed in his resignation to Sherman once Oliver Howard was promoted over him to lead one wing of Sherman's army. Though, of course, in that particular case, there is also the fact that Hooker had long since blamed Howard for his conduct at the Battle of Chancellorsville, and in fact blamed Howard rather than himself as the cause of the major Union defeat. As a sideline, this was somewhat unjustly. While Howard certainly didn't perform very well at Chancellorsville, it was still Hooker's overall battle plan, and in the end, the Supreme Commander is finally to blame, one way or the other, whether you like it or not. But in my opinion, there is little doubt that as a core commander in the early years of the war until he got promoted to army command, and then again as a core commander after that, Hooker was by far one of the best generals the North had. Had he had a more friendly personality and better ability to accept criticism, he could well have been one of the top Union commanders of the Civil War quite in line with people like Thomas or Sherman or even Grant and Sheridan. Now, he wasn't, which is one of the reasons why I deliberately left him out of my first video, but he was good enough to easily, in my opinion, deserve a place as number five on my current list of corps and division commanders. Joseph Hooker, number five. <laughs> Richard Anderson. Now, Richard Anderson, who was a Confederate general, by the way, for those who might not know him, is one of the more difficult generals to enunciate why I put him on this list. Except for one specific moment at Spotsylvania Courthouse, where he had succeeded to James Longstreet in command of the First Corps while Longstreet was wounded, and led his forces into a position that basically saved the Confederate army and and allowed Lee to prolong the war with another nine months. There is no real one position you can point at and say this was the genius of Richard Anderson. Rather, he just commanded his division and later his corps with a certain kind of constant competence rather than moments of brilliance. He would never become a Stonewall Jackson. He would never become a Robert E. Lee. He would never become even a James Longstreet, but at the same time, all of these you can point at and say, this battle they don't do well in, or this battle they made a blundering mistake. You can't really point out anything like that of Richard Anderson. He just served with spectacular 
popular competence throughout the war. He was a very good general, if not necessarily a very brilliant general, and he basically always did what people asked him to do. This is a very important skill in a commanding general that should not be underestimated. During the Napoleonic Wars, probably the second best British general after the Duke of Wellington was Daddy Hill, Roland Hill, who was famous for, in Wellington's words, I always know where Hill are and where I can find him. The same thing can be said for Anderson. He was not a brilliant commanding general, but he was dependable, trustworthy, successful, and imaginative and determined to succeed in the task he had been given by his superiors, even without the restless energy of a John Bell Hood or the swaggering certainty of a George Pickens or many other generals at the time. Anderson was just a really good commander who did what he was asked to do and did it incredibly well for the entire war. Even his greatest defeat when his fourth corps was finally dissolved in battle at Sailor's Creek in the waning days of the Appomattox campaign, acting as a rearguard for General Lee's army, this is hardly something Anderson can be blamed for. His men were tired, dispirited, down to less than half their size and facing some of the best Union veterans at the time, and he still managed to get half of that corps back to Lee's army after having actually been surrounded. To me, in a certain degree, that actually speaks a lot better than a lot of what other generals encountered who were far more brilliant. So yes, for constant competence and for being a very good general without having either flashes of brilliance nor flashes of sheer incompetence, number four on my list is Richard Anderson. Number three, James McPherson, the shining prodigy of the Federal Army, the favorite protege of Ulysses Grant and William Sherman, and the man that they had both tapped and prepared to be the supreme commander of the Union war effort should they themselves had fallen. In fact, Grant's infatuation with Sheridan only came to pass after he had moved away from James McPherson. McPherson, and especially after McPherson had died in the waning days of the Battle of Atlanta. To a certain degree, McPherson can be said to be the same kind of general as Richard Anderson, only better, in as much as while he also served with just general competence, he did have those flashes of brilliance that Anderson can perhaps be said to be lacking, while he certainly didn't really have at the same time any of those moments of incompetence that so many any other brilliant generals were bedeviled by during the American Civil War. He was a young man being born in 1828 and first came to prominence when he was Grant's chief engineer during the coup de main that took forts Henry and Donelson and opened the river system to the north and in fact propelled Grant into national fame and general army command. And having served on Grant's personal staff for a while, he continued to be in division and Corps command under First Grant and then Sherman out in the West constantly. In many ways, he made the same kind of tandem for Grant with Sherman that Longstreet and Stonewall Jackson did for Lee. One aggressive, brilliant mind to do all the really difficult stuff and smash the opponents, and one almost as equally brilliant but perhaps a little bit aggressive and erratically brilliant to keep the enemies pinned and allow for their destruction. When Grant was called away to lead the entire Union war effort and moved out east, McPherson became Sherman's primary striking arm and most prominent corps commander, and served with distinction throughout the Georgia campaign up until the Battle of Atlanta where he was killed. His only sort of defeat or setback came at Snake Creek Gap, where had he pushed onward with his army instead of trying to hold the pass throughout the mountains he had taken, he might have been able to cut off the army of Joe Johnston and in fact force the entire Confederate war effort in the West to collapse. But despite the fact that Sherman told him that he had truly missed the opportunity of a life, he was only in obedience toward Sherman's orders. So I'm hardly going to put that as a major strike against McPherson's record. So, McPherson. 
Johnson, number three on my list. A man I can't say too much about. He was a happy and joyful man that everyone liked. One of the few generals who had very few, if any, personal enemies in the army. And was, in fact, beloved by many of the other side, who he had, of course, served with before the Civil War and been educated with at West Point. There are few moments in McPherson's military history that stands out with any degree of golden crowning glory. Again, like I said, he was very much like Richard Anderson, only better. While Anderson served as a very good general with complete and constant competency, McPherson did the same only with those flashes of brilliance that come from someone who could have become a supremely effective commander, but who simply never reached the epogee of his powers because he was killed at a way too early age. Number three on my list, James McPherson, the great prodigy who never really achieved what he might have been able to. Number two, Patrick Cleburne, the Stonewall of the West. In my opinion, the finest Confederate commander to actually serve almost continuously in the Western theater of the war. A man of tactical skill but strategic brilliance. A man who probably had he been in command of the army rather than several other commanders such as Bragg or Hood would have been a lot better for the Confederacy out West insofar as he could in all probability have led the army with the same kind of caution that Johnston has while combining that with the aggression that Hood had only with that kept under control. Cleburne was born in Ireland and only chose to fight for the South because he had spent a lot of time there. He did not fight for slavery, in fact he despised the institution, according to himself at least, and he was one of the first Confederate generals who supported and proposed enrolling black slaves or freed slaves into the Confederate armies, winning him many enemies amongst the more, shall we say, ideologically staunch Confederate politicians and military commanders. Now, Cleburne is a difficult man to position because like someone, as I mentioned earlier, such as Hooker, he fought in a lot of battles where his army lost, and yet he was almost constantly one of the lights in the darkness. His greatest moments probably came at Chickamauga, where it was his forces more than anyone's who led the charge that broke the Union and gave the Confederates their biggest and to some degree only real major strategic victory in the West and later at the Battle of Chattanooga he was the one who held Sherman's forces at the lower end of the Confederate lines at Missionary Ridge. He was so feared by the North that there are rumors of Northern regiments dreading to see his banner flying over the battlefields and in fact certain troops are reported to have run away simply by real realizing that they would be facing Cleburne's brigades. And his brilliance and continual skill and effectiveness was such that Lee himself described him as a shining meteor from a clouded sky. So, why is this man not number one on my list? Well, first of all, because, well, number one is himself a spectacularly good general, and I will of course get back to that in a short second, but Cleburne didn't survive to the ending of the war. He was killed at the Battle of Nashville where John Bell Hood shattered the Western Confederate armies against the defenses of John Schofield and of course later had his army completely destroyed at the Battle of Nashville a few weeks later. At Franklin, Cleburne, whose strategic vision had of course clearly told him that this attack was a terrible mistake and in fact opposed Hood with it, still performed with his usual style and brand of Elan and led his troops forward in person where he was eventually killed. Had he survived and had he been placed in command of what was left of Hood's shattered forces, I believe that he might in fact have turned them into something again resembling even remotely a useful force that might have prolonged the war even just a little bit, or had he been placed in command of the army before that instead of Hood, he might have led it with far more skill and perhaps followed Sherman to the sea, 
catching up with him and inflicting perhaps a defeat on him, which would have allowed the South to a certain degree of success. But these are what if situations. Anyway, number two on my list for his continual strategic brilliance, his continual tactical superb ability, and simply for being possibly the best commander of the Confederate side, not named Longstreet, Lee, or Jackson. I give you number two on my list, Patrick Cleburne. Finally, number one, Winfield Scott Hancock. Hancock the Superb, the Thunderbolt of the Army of the Potomac. And no, I am not just bringing Hancock into number one here because everyone in the first video said that I should have put him in that one, apparently not understanding that he was simply a corps commander and never assumed direct personal control of an army, but simply because Hancock was, in my opinion, the single finest corps commander who never actually held personal army control. Hancock served well throughout the early days of the war, distinguishing himself in the Peninsula campaign, fighting well in the rest of Northern Virginia, fighting well in the Overland campaign. In fact, some believe that when he arrived at Antietam, he would have led a counterattack that would probably have won the day for the North had he not, in fact, brought orders from McClellan to hold his position and adhered to those. He fought well at Petersburg, despite his corps suffering severe damages in the futile attack on Mary's height ordered by Burnside at his most incompetent and at Chancellorsville it was Hancock's corps that formed the rear guard and held off the Army of Northern Virginia so that the Army of the Potomac could limp away and begin some quick reorganization without being completely destroyed as a fighting force. Of course Hancock's greatest moment as a corps commander came at Gettysburg where he was in charge of the Northern Army for the better part of the first day supervising its retreat from the riches north of town to Cemetery Hill south of it and creating the fishhook defense line that held against all of Lee's attack in the next couple of days. During the second day of Gettysburg he was superbly important in holding the center of the Union line, especially after Sickles did his little thing about moving his forces ahead of the rest of the Union army and drawing the forces of both sides into the massive bloodshed of the Union center. It was was Hancock's strategic vision that allowed him to sacrifice the first Minnesota to allow him to gain more troops and hold the Union line. And of course, it was on the third day that it was troop under his command that shattered Pickett's charge and held against the high water mark of the Confederacy, destroying the last chance Lee had to win the battle and in fact, to a certain degree, dooming the Confederacy in the East at least to final defeat in the war. Hancock was severely wounded at this point, but kept commanding his troops on the field until he was forcibly taken behind, still encouraging his men by waving around his cigar to let them know he was in fact not dead. This wound caused a certain fallout in Hancock's abilities and during the Overland campaign while he conducted himself with his usual skill and intensity it was obvious to all that he was not quite the Hancock that used to be before he was injured. He served with great distinction in the earliest days of the wilderness but it was also his corps that was then rolled up by Longstreet's counterattack that allowed Lee to claim that battle as a draw and allow Hill to withdraw unmolested towards the defenses around Richmond and near Cold Harbor. In fact, it was after Cold Harbor and the magnificent slaughter there that Hancock turned in his active field command for rear echelon positions for the rest of the war. Beyond him being just a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant core commander, Hancock was also a very nice and personable fellow, again, without any real sort of enemy just a really good person and of course his immense loyalty to the Union and also while still being a Democrat allowed him to run a very strong Democratic presidential campaign in 1880 losing only very narrowly to James A. Garfield.
Garfield. So yes, overall, with everything in mind for his magnificent results in the war from 1861 until just after Gettysburg, I name Winfield Scott Hancock as number one on my list of the finest American Civil War commanders, corps, and division levels, and if I ever do a list of just the finest generals of the American Civil War, Hancock will in all probability also be on it if it goes in any way beyond a top five. All right then, that was it. My top seven of the finest American Civil War generals, North and South, on the same list, holding divisional or core command. Finally, I got this done after having promised it for so very long. Anyway, if you agree with me, let me know in the comments. If you disagree with me, let me know in the comments. If you like to see more on this subject, let me know in the comments. Right now, I'm just so happy that I have finally managed to do this because I have promised it for so very long and I have felt so bad about not actually getting it out there. Until next time, I have been the Sage and I wish you all a very happy day.